Hello, everybody. And this is Stacy from The Advisor. And today I'm very excited because we have Ellie Young on the show and she is an alcohol free coach. And I'm very excited to have her on the show because she has some amazing um, tools and strategies and things to tell us to help you become alcohol free. So Ellie, tell people a little about yourself and what you do. Sure. Thank you so much for having me, Stacey. It's an honor. Um, so I'm an alcohol-free life coach. I've been doing uh, coaching formally for about a year and a half now. Um, I'm three years alcohol-free after sufficiently pickling myself through the pandemic and homeschooling. And um, I was certified with this naked mind as a alcohol-free life coach about a year and a half ago. And um I coach women and we do group programs. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching and it really has provided me a ton of purpose and passion in my life. Um, because after I got alcohol free, the impact it had on my health and that of my family's was, was profound. And to be honest, I, I really couldn't keep my mouth shut about it. I felt compelled to pay this gift forward and to share this with as many women as possible. I think that's great. You know, I, it, COVID hit people very hard emotionally, um, physically, and, you know, being confined in, in your house, you know, pe people felt really, it was very frustrating for people. People became depressed. People were going through anger issues because they didn't want to be in their house and they were forced to be, do something they didn't want to do. And, you know, some people just being in the house alone, you know, when you're not outside and you're, you you don't have the freedom to just walk around and enjoy life and to interact with other human beings, it could be very depressing. So people, a lot of people were tending to go to alcohol and, and, you know, and use that as a tool, as a coping mechanism. And a lot of people even use food as a coping mechanism. And, you know, but it's it's really hard when when people you know have to you know they don't know how to deal with their emotions so they they use something to help them you know deal with their emotions to make them feel good it's kind of like a comforting source and yeah. for you like you know how did you know when it wasn't just casual drinking and it became a problem for you yeah well i think i followed the normal trajectory that most people, most girls do, you know, party through college, um, binge, drink, binge drinking was normalized. I was an athlete in college. I played um, division one college soccer. So I was definitely a part of this athlete party scene. And then young adulthood, you know, became like, you know, happy hours. It became more of like a, a symbol of adulthood and status to be, you know, go out and be yeah. able to spend money on fancy drinks and go wine tasting. Um, you know, there was so much more of a sophistication to it at that, at that phase of life. Yeah. Um, when I became a mother was definitely when my drinking turned into what I would call like benign social fun and celebrating to like a coping mechanism. Yeah. But again, this was conditioned into me as well, that it was normal to reward myself as a mother for the sacrifice, for the hard work, for the sleepless nights with that glass of wine and, or like girls nights out. It, it, it was, it was always this way of saying, oh, you know what? You deserve this. You've worked so hard. Yeah. Um, and during the pandemic, you know, I never had questioned it. I definitely had red flags, I would say, but again, they're so normalized. Like I had blackouts, I had, you know, crushing hangovers. Um, but as a mother, I wouldn't really allow myself to ever be hungover. I would power through it. I would still yeah. get up early with the kids. I would still work out really hard. I would never even, I would deny myself really any bad feelings because I would say, well, you're fine. It was almost like to accept a hangover would to, would be to accept that I had some, like I had to stop. Yeah. And so I pushed through it. Um, and then, you know, ironically would reward myself again with more alcohol. Yeah. Um, and so that little cycle kind of continued and became exacerbated during the pandemic because um, my I had a third grader and a kindergartner at the time. And we discovered during homeschool that my third grader had ADHD. Um, I had kind of, they had kind of hinted at it during his school years. He was always the wiggly one, had the special chair, had to sit on the outside of the circle because he couldn't sit still. Um, his third grade teacher at his last conference said, you know, it looks painful for him to sit still. 
Yeah. And so we were just starting those conversations with his teachers when, when the pandemic hit and it was a nightmare. Like he couldn't sit in front of that little computer. He couldn't follow. He didn't know what was going on. He was hitting all the buttons. He was running, getting up and running around. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I thought I could do it. I thought I could manage the homeschooling and I took it personally that I, that, you know, that I thought I was failing him. Yeah. And there were lots of tears and lots of yelling. Um, and every day I'd wake up thinking like, okay, I can figure this out. I can do this. Yeah. But I, I just slowly started drinking more and more to cope with that. Um, and finally at the end of, uh, 2020, it was New Year's. I decided I'm going to try dry January. You know, I really knew I needed to make a change. I don't think I had fully confronted yeah. how destructive it was in my life again, because I was afraid of the shame of what that would even mean. Right. Yeah. Nobody, mm -hmm. nobody wants to look at themselves and say, I, I'm singling myself out that I'm different than the rest of everyone. Like I have a problem while well, everyone else gets to enjoy this substance. Yeah. I don't. Um, and I learned later in my training and in all, you know, all of the recovering that I did that there was nothing wrong with me. Right. You know, I, I was using an addictive substance that had been, that I'd been conditioned to use. Yeah. And it really take, took me waking up. Um, and so that first dry January, I failed. I didn't, I didn't make it all the way through, mm -hmm. but it was at that point that I realized this is bigger than me. Like this is, I need help. Um, and that's when I just started diving into tons of quitlet books. And, um, I hired a coach actually myself that I used for four months in addition to a therapist. Right. Um, and when I got clear and got healthy, I was now able to help my son and get him the help that he needed. Right. And everything just snowballed from there in a positive trajectory, because I was no longer blaming myself for this problem that was going on with, you know, my son. Yeah. And it really allowed that clarity really allowed me to, to make a huge change. You know, a lot of times, you know, people, you know, um, they, they use a coping mechanism and a lot of times it stems from their root cause. It, it stems from something going back in their childhood or something traumatic happening in their life. And, you know, it kind of sticks with them and, you know, and they, you know, they start to use other things to cope with life as they go along. And then sometimes it just escalates and it becomes, you know, worse and worse and worse. And sometimes they just right away, they, they'll use alcohol or they'll mm -hmm. use food as a way to like, you know, just cope with emotions that they have that have kind of like traveled with them and just kind of leached onto them through for years. And, you know, for you, do you feel that, you know, some of these issues that you were dealing with in your present moment of your life kind of, kind of filtered back from either childhood or traumatic events or things happening along the way that just kind of escalated to the point where you just needed something stronger. You just needed, you needed that quick fix type of thing. Yeah. Again, I don't think there was ever a really conscious moment of me saying, you know, alcohol is going to help with this. I think it was just a subconscious um, self-medicating at some point. And yeah, the work again, it wasn't, I wasn't aware of it when I was doing it, but now that I've had three years to look back on it, I think like a lot of women, I felt that I was not worthy unless I was like overachieving to the max, right? And staying busy yeah. and self-sacrificing as a mother. And I almost used alcohol as like fuel for that versus trying to cope. It was more like, I have to get through this. Yeah. And I, I have things in my life that I'm dissatisfied with, um, but I can't speak up, right? I, I'm yeah. afraid to speak up. I'm just gonna, you know, get through it and keep, and keep quiet. Yeah. Uh, but in a, been a, been in an oddly like overachieving, you know, super mom type of way. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. I just kept taking more and more on yeah. and I, it's a, it's a people pleasing coping mechanism as well here where you're, you don't want to say no to anybody. Right. And, um, you know, I have a, I actually have a podcast myself and I have a whole episode on people pleasing and alcohol because my relationship yeah. with my husband with young children was 
I don't blame him, but I took on everything, but I enabled that. Mm -hmm. And then I drank to cope with it. Right. I just went, oh, woe is me. You know, I have to do these things. And I think, I think a lot of women get stuck in that place instead of kind of putting their foot down and, and asking for what they need. Yeah. A lot of the discomfort in early sobriety is that you're no longer going to be numbing that dissatisfaction in life anymore. Yeah. That anxiety and that discomfort you feel is kind of like, it's forcing you to make a change. It's forcing you just to, to set some boundaries and to say like, I need help with this or no, I don't want to do that. And who am I? Like, you know, I, I don't think it's, I, I really believe it's so difficult for women with young children to even get to a place where they can even confront this because there is just nothing but self-sacrifice at that phase. But a lot of women in their forties start to be able to find their voice and their feet again, because mm-hmm. their kids are older and they have more autonomy and they're starting to recognize like, whoa, there's like a person inside here who hasn't been listened to, who yeah. hasn't been taken care of in a really long time. I have just been numbing myself with alcohol, yeah. pretending I'm living my best life. You know, we dress it up as like, woohoo, this is me mm-hmm. drinking my fancy wine. And yeah. um, at the end of the day, it was making us sick. And it was compounding our anxiety and our depression and our loneliness. And um, that's really like the moment I want to like, just shake people and be like, this isn't helping you. There's yeah. a world out there that you can live and that doesn't require you to numb yourself with a neurotoxin. Yeah. And I, I feel so many women, I actually know so many women that actually will They take everything, they feel that they have to take on the world and it's their duty to. And so many of them, you could just see their worn out looking. They're just, they're just tired. You could just see their face. You could see the the way they look and they're not as spunky as they used to be. And they're not dressing themselves up like they used to be. And all they're focusing on is everybody else but themselves. And they feel guilt and they feel shame if they don't you know, and self-love and self-care is all the way on the bottom of the list for them when it should be the first thing on the list. Do you find that? Absolutely. I, again, yeah, I think it's alcohol is the biggest pacifier for women and it's kept us down. It's kept us small. And again, it's been marketed to us as this solution, as this glamour, as this, uh, you know, her permission to use it as a way to cope. Yeah. And um, you know, we, it, I, I joke that like after a long week with my kids, I would have had more mental struggle with like, you know what I need, I need a massage. Yeah. I'm going to go, I'm going to go treat myself to a massage. That would have seemed indulgent. That would have seemed like, oh, you know, mm-hmm. I would have felt guilty, but yeah. drinking a bottle of wine was like, oh yeah, of course go, go for it. You know? Yeah. And it's just so backwards, right. That like yeah. what bodies and what our brains really needed was this self-care that we felt guilty giving ourselves, but yet poisoning ourselves is like completely okay. Yeah. Just like, wait a minute, how did we get to this place? Right. Right. I think sometimes we're not honest with ourselves too. We're not looking at what it's actually doing to us. You know, we might know deep down inside, but kind of put it on the back burner, you know, and we're just looking at, okay, it's making me feel good, you know, and that's all that matters because it's taken off the edge and that's all I need right now. But they're not looking long-term. They're just looking for that moment because that's all it's going to be. It's going to be for that right. moment. And then reality is going to set in. And I think that's when, when the, you know, I know you're not crazy about using the word alcoholism, but that's when the alcoholism and, and the addiction kind of sets itself in is when, you know, you, you get, you, you're, you're drinking, you're feeling great, you know, but it only lasts for so long. And then you're, you're going for another one just to make that feeling continue and continue and continue. And then, you know, a couple of drinks turns into, you know, more drinks and then a drink the next day and a drink the next day and a drink the next day. And before you know it, it's become habitual. It's like, you're, it's a habit. It's, and, and it's in, and it's the only way that you know how to cope because it's, you've done it for so long. It's like when you wake up in the morning and you have a cup of coffee, every time you wake up in the morning, becomes a habit, you know? Right. So for some people, you might be getting up, getting a cup of coffee. Somebody, somebody might be getting a glass of wine as crazy as it, might, it may sound because they'll take off the edge as soon as they wake up and then they'll start their routine and do their other stuff. But, you know, I know so many people that were, you know, using alcohol and, and they were drinking early in the morning because they were just 
all the emotions from the previous day were with them the next day when they woke up to reality, you know? So then they just needed that, that fix, you know, and that's not a way to live life and that you can't function when you live life like that yeah. now. So go ahead. Oh, no, um, you're, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. I, I fully believe that people are unaware of that. They're battling their own biochemistry and yeah, yeah the nature of an addictive substance is, is what it does to your chemistry. And it creates this craving within your body. Um, if you don't mind, I'll go into the, like the science here a little bit. Yeah, please do. It's one of the most powerful lessons that people can, can learn that will help them debunk the belief that like alcohol helps me manage stress and anxiety, because you're right. They're after that 20 minute buzz, but that's it. Your blood alcohol yeah. rises for 20 minutes. And then your body recognizing this kind of out of balance state, it's a huge dopamine boost, right? Yeah. It then course corrects with a neuropeptide called dynorphin. Mm -hmm. And dynorphin is essentially the opposite of endorphins. It mm -hmm. pulls you below your, your dopamine baseline, creating yeah. a little void. It creates like anxious feelings, discomfort. And that's, we, we interpret that as the buzz wearing off and we're like, yeah. oh, I need another drink. But that next drink never pulls you up as high as that first buzz yeah. because your brain is really adaptive. It is right. saying, we don't want to get out of balance like that again. Keep pumping out dynorphin. And what it does is it essentially just starts to pull you lower and lower and lower with each subsequent drink. Yes. And the brain then course corrects from that with adrenaline and cortisol. So yeah. that's why you wake up at 3 a.m. with your heart racing, with irrational thoughts and you're just flooded with anxiety and that unfortunately lasts a lot longer in the system days yeah. than that buzz so we're literally trading 20 minutes of a high for like days of of discomfort and anxiousness in our body and when you're drinking regularly you are chronically that's why they call it a depressant you are chronically low because your brain is anticipating that at any moment you're going to flood it with too much dopamine with this, with this drug essentially. Yeah. So it proactively keeps you in a low depressive state. Right. And this is a function of tolerance as well. So you'll notice after you drink over time, you need more. So it doesn't just work on alcohol though, your pleasure circuits, it now needs a lot of everything to make yourself feel good. So like the little things, a sunrise, holding your child's hand, you know, seeing the flowers, gentle breezes, things like that, that used to register like a, a lovely little dopamine bo boost. You don't even feel it anymore. Yeah. And that's, that's what most people aren't even aware of. Even yeah. if you're just like, Oh, I'm a social drinker. It's impacting your pleasure circuits in this way. Right. You're not, you're not feeling the full breath of life anymore. Right. Exactly. No, that's so true. That's so true. Now for people that want to become alcohol free, what would be you call step one? What's step one? Because a lot of people want to be alcohol free. They just don't know where to begin. Yeah. Um, I know. I, and I think that willpower comes into play here where people think it's really only a matter of me just trying really, really hard. And it starts to feel like this, this marathon of deprivation. Yeah. And so I try to back up from that and say, what is it that is causing us to feel so deprived? Yeah. And it's really, it's really these beliefs. Mm -hmm. So we start with the mental side of things. We start with hacking those subconscious beliefs that are keeping you craving. And so the most, the most popular ones that everybody experiences are like alcohol helps with my stress and anxiety. Mm -hmm we investigate that is that really true and then you know we teach them the science and so it takes time to kind of chip away at these beliefs because it's like this huge structure sitting in your subconscious that has been yeah. built over decades and decades and decades and so even though we have this like conscious desire to change it it's up against this huge system that has been yeah. telling you alcohol is the answer for so long yeah. and so once we start to kind of deconstruct that old belief we have to replace it with a new one. You have to, you have to find a new belief that better serves you. And it's, if it's like, okay, now I know alcohol is not helping with my stress and anxiety. It's making it worse. What does help with my stress and anxiety? What yeah. can I tell myself in this moment? And it's usually like, 
I need a walk outside. Mm -hmm. I need more sleep. I need some self-care. I need some time alone. Right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. often those things are difficult to incorporate in our life. It's a lot easier to reach for that bottle. Yeah. That, that friction we feel is growth. That is change and it's going to be uncomfortable, but it's the right thing. And it's, and it's the healthy thing. And so we train our brain then. So after we work on these subconscious beliefs, we then hack the physical habit and we have to say, now we have to replace this habit with something that feels good. We yeah. have to train our brain to crave a new behavior that yeah. delivers a dopamine boost. Cause your brain is like, I want that boost. Right. I want something. And so I go through a process called dopamine stacking with people where we start to build in rituals and behaviors that are going to help you slowly incrementally stack your dopamine. So you feel good, yeah. but unfortunately nothing gives you as big a high as alcohol does, right? Nothing yeah. is that fast or that easy. So it's, it becomes, you know, a systematic lifestyle approach where we're like, we're going to, we're going to wake up in the morning. We're going to carve out five, 10 minutes of our day to tell our system we're going to love you today. Yeah. We're going to nourish you. We're going to take care of you like, like we would a baby today. Right. I love that. Yeah. And, you know, and what would be like step two? So if you, once you start to realize, you know, that it's, it's a temporary high and you start to, you realize that you have to start chipping down those beliefs and creating a new lifestyle, a new healthy lifestyle for yourself. Mm -hmm. What would be like the next step for somebody? So now you, you've worked through the science of it. You're understanding the concept. You understand what it's doing to your body. You understand why you're reacting and why your behaviors have changed so erratically over a course of a specific time, however long you've been drinking. Because I've seen people, you know, they, like you said, they go to that extremity where, you know, just little things don't make them happy anymore. They, it's either nothing or all the way, you know, because they just can't, they, they don't know happy medium anymore. That doesn't even exist in their vocabulary anymore. So once you realize all this, and now you understand why you behave this the way you do. So what would be the next step for people that they would have to start to understand and, and start to work towards? So this is the part where we hack the physical habit. And so this is, I've adapted this from James Clear, Atomic Habits, where, where we get really specific about our environments that we're in. Mm -hmm. And we start to work on the cue, the craving, the response, and the reward. Right. And so each little step of that physical habit has a place where our brain is going, oh, we're cued to drink right now. Yeah. And so so we work on those cues. We work on the craving aspect of it is where that mental side comes in because yeah. the craving comes because we believe alcohol has some sort of perceived benefit in the moment. And yeah. so once we've worked on our subconscious beliefs, we'll recognize it because we've pulled it out of our subconscious and we're saying, hey, I caught myself. I'm stressed out. And I thought this bottle of wine is going to help me right now. Right. And you have now created this little buffer of space to go, wait a minute, how should I respond here? Should I, should I try to hop on that autopilot loop that wants to drink? Or should I try to use a little more energy now to push myself into that new behavior and right. what I help my clients do is you have to have a go-to strategy at your fingertips. Um, you have to have a toolkit because if you're caught off guard, you know, your brain, it's, it's a, it, it's lazy. It wants to not think it wants to get on the tried and true loop that we've done over and over again. It takes more energy, it takes more friction to try this new strategy. And so we rehearse, I help my clients rehearse mentally over and over. What are we going to do instead? You know, what yeah. is our strategy that has that dopamine stacking built in? Yeah. And you rehearse it just like an athlete does, mm -hmm. because the more you can just imagine yourself doing the thing you really want to do, yeah. a little girl pathway starts to form and you just need to continue to strengthen that and strengthen that. And I also love to play with visualization with my clients where we say, what would it feel like 30 days from now that you've yeah. been living alcohol free? And we meditate and we visualize this and we get really, really, really specific about how that feels in the body. Because when you do this, this is just another neuro neuroscience trick. 
Yeah. You're not only forming those little neural pathways, you're literally creating the possibility in your brain by just imagining it. Yeah. And you're giving your brain a future sampling of this and it starts to release the feel good chemistry associated with that. Cause your brain doesn't know the difference, right? Right. I, I love this trick because we can make ourselves sick with worry, right? We've all yeah. experienced that. We can literally change our heart rate just from thoughts alone. Yeah. And adrenaline and cortisol starts flooding our system, right? We can actually do that in the positive way. Right. And when we do these kind of manifestation visualizations of like me 30 days from now, alcohol free, thriving, sleeping, exercising, you know, having great relationships, you know, having integrity, fulfilling my goals that when you get really clear and, and, and imagine that your brain is like, yes. And it starts to like release all that feel good stuff yeah. and it strengthens that neural pathway. And all of a sudden that now exists in your brain. And so yeah. now when opportunity presents itself for you to lean in that direction, mm -hmm. it's, it's easier because it's had a little taste and it's like, yeah. oh, I want that now. I want to make that happen. I want to make right. that. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So when you're working, do you, you incorporate meditation on a daily basis? Do you have people like just working on really understand their inner self because then they really can understand what their needs are. And, you know, is that something that you, you do like it, when you go to the next step and, you know, when you have them on, on their, on their way of, of changing their lifestyle, is, is that something that they do? Yeah. You know, everybody's different and everybody, um, can adapt to these strategies kind of in their own way. Um, yes, meditation is definitely something that is, is part of the toolkit, but I have found for people who, um, that's too big a leap mm -hmm. that, we do things called awe walks, which is like a moving meditation, a walking meditation where we go out, you know, I mean, I say we, but um, I don't go with them, um, you know, but we, they, they get up in the morning and they go outside for 10 minutes and they experience the walk with all five of their senses yeah. where they really tap into like feeling the air passing through their fingertips. And what do they see? What do they smell? What do they taste in the air? Um, and really just tuning in to all five of those senses. And I call it an awe walk because awe is an emotion that you can access better when you are alcohol free yeah. because you are more tuned in to your intuition and you start to feel small and you start to feel the the bigness of the universe and just yeah. Um, it, it quiets the ruminating mind and it has all these profound health benefits. And so I tell people like, you don't have to go to the Grand Canyon. You don't have to see a sunrise. You, Sorry, my dog. Go to yeah. um, you can just access this in your own backyard or just going for a short little walk around the block yeah. um, and tapping into that healing pharmacy that's just within you. It's yeah. all with you. And that's, that's, what's so amazing about being alcohol free is you're like, oh my gosh, I have been using a neurotoxin to try and feel good. And I have it all inside me. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And, and when people are, are going towards the next step, because a lot of times people are very fragile when they're coming off of alcohol and they, they can't handle a lot. You know, that's one of the reasons why they go to alcohol in the first place, because they're having a tough time just handling a lot of things in their life. So when you're moving them to these different steps, is there a, another step that you go to once you've pranced out and you really, you know, have this idea of, you know, what you're doing. So one, you, you break the belief, you break the, the habit Two, then you start to really, you know, understand yourself and understand what you really want for yourself. And, you know, and you name some ways of doing that. And then what would be the next step, you know, after that? It's really about creating a life that you don't feel this need to escape from mm -hmm. uh, and, and being really intentional about, taking really good care of yourself. And so it's building in these rituals that really start to reward your nervous system and reward your circuitry. So yeah, what the, the three-step process is really like get hack the um, mental beliefs yeah, and the physical beliefs, mm -hmm. or, or, I'm sorry, the physical habit. Yeah. Yes. And we build this life that we don't have to escape from. Right. And that's where all the other healing 
and um, health kind of efforts start to stack up one by one and you just start to feel amazing. And so where I have kind of taken my clients in this next phase, once they feel control with the alcohol, yeah, start going into hormone balancing mm -hmm. because most women have realized that like, oh my gosh, I didn't realize alcohol was making me feel as bad as it was. We've all been kind of just accustomed to yeah. low hangovers and anxiety and depression. So once we remove that, then you can really fine tune what is going on with your health. And right. you're like, oh, okay. I can, I can feel my body. I can listen to my body because I'm not in recovery mode all the time yeah. and I'm not chasing it with caffeine or like supplements. Um, and so now you're, you have this opportunity to really because most women are already doing all the things we've, we're all trying the exercise and diets and supplements and, you know, meditation. We've all, you know, we, we live in a very mindful, healthy mm -hmm. world. Now there's lots of opportunity to do these things, yeah. but if we were drinking, it really was setting us back in every aspect of the, of, of those efforts. Yeah. Um, so the hormone balancing is often the next step that I, I do with my clients. And it's a natural progression because you're going to be so in touch with your body once alcohol's out of the picture and we can start to fine tune the hormones. And how do you do that actually? Like what's, what is, is the process of that? Um, well, I have like an assessment that I take you through that I've adapted from um, some diff a, a variety of experts that I follow. And after we kind of, and we do all this without any blood work. So I am not a doctor, full disclaimer, but mm -hmm. I have a lot of experience doing this, not only with myself, and but lots and lots of clients. And what we do is we just, we start cycle syncing. So first we get, become very aware of our cycle. A lot of women, unless you were trying to get pregnant recently, we're kind of unaware of our cycles mm -hmm. uh, and, and espe especially uh, the different hormonal needs at the different phases of our cycle. And, and if you're like me, I was someone who was trying to diet the same all month long. I was like trying to be low carb, trying to work out hard all the time. I never changed anything. Right. Other yeah. than like maybe working in a rest day or two when I was like too sore, or too tired. Um, and I had no idea that that was impacting my hormonal health and that actually I should be phasing in, you know, different diet styles and phasing in exercise intensity levels. Um, and that, that would better support my overall health. Yeah. Uh, awareness of our cycle is kind of the first step. And then we start cycle syncing where we are adjusting our nutrition and adjust, adjusting our exercise levels and lifestyles to match our hormonal needs at the time. Right. And for most women, that means dialing back. It yeah. means eating more carbohydrate. It means resting more and going inward. And, and again, listening, listening to our bodies and what it really needs. Right. Yeah. A lot of women, all women, really, when you get to a certain age and it could be any age, you know, like I, I started going through perimenopause at 39. So mm -hmm. it was like, you know, you could, it could happen to you at any time. You know, some people are later, some people are early, you know, but mm -hmm. it, it's recognizing that you're, you're changing all of a sudden. And, and a lot of women don't even realize what's going on because it's just, you know, they're just clueless because that, you know, they've never experienced this before. They just know that they don't feel the way they used to. And just the, these things are happening to them and they, they have no clue why it's, it's, it's happening. Exactly. And, and alcohol plays a big role in that, right? Because it's probably the biggest factor. Um, a big thing I teach my clients is this kind of hormone hierarchy and that cortisol and insulin kind of sit at the top and they impact the release of all of our sex hormones, our estrogen and our progesterone. So you can't really fine tune your estrogen and your progesterone, which are causing all this havoc in, in perimenopause without addressing your, your insulin and your cortisol. Mm -hmm. And alcohol affects both of those dramatically. Yeah. It wrecks our sleep and it raises our cortisol level chronically. Mm -hmm. And with that going on, it's really, really hard to, to balance your hormones. Yeah. And so we really have to start at the tippity top and, and then work our way down. Um, so cortisol managing stress levels is another kind of angle that a lot of women were just unaware of how much it, it's impacting us. Um, and it really does get to that place of like, where are you on your priority list? Like, are you 
we all say we don't have time mm-hmm. and we're all self-sacrificing and we're all working and we're all managing so many things. But if we're not making our health a priority, all of this is for not all of the diets, all of the exercise, it's just, it's, it's working uphill. Yeah. And so we have to really go to the tippity top and say, I need to take care of this cortisol. And for most women, that means cutting the alcohol Yeah. and, and then you can sleep and then we can start get, you know, fine tuning that hormonal balance. Right. Exactly. Now, do you have any like, um, advice for people who have high cl- uh, cortisol levels. Cause there's a lot of women who suffer from high cortisol. My best remedy for cortisol, high cortisol is movement mm-hmm. and it doesn't have to be intense. It can be as light as you need it, but you have to move your body. And so what high cortisol does is it releases stored sugar. Your liver thinks, oh my gosh, we're in fight or flight mode. You have to be ready to like run away from a tiger. Although Mm -hmm. Most of the stress is in our minds, right? It's a perceived threat and it floods our system with sugar thinking that you need to run. And and oftentimes we're sitting at a desk or we're driving in a car and we don't, we're not able to use that sugar. So insulin rate rises and then it just stores it as fat body. Mm -hmm. So when you feel that flood of cortisol, One of the best things you can do is just get up and go for a short walk. You're basically just telling your muscles, Hey, utilize that sugar that's now in your bloodstream. And it, it takes it out of the bloodstream, which helps lower your insulin. Um, and it can just be jumping jacks. It could be some air squats, you know, wherever you are, people think I'm the crazy lady at the Mm -hmm. soccer field. Cause I do a lot of like aerobics on the sideline. And Mm -hmm. every now and then I get some other moms to join in with me as that's cool. But, you know, that's really what it is. And it doesn't have to be like, oh, you have to get to the gym for an hour every day. It can be set a little alarm on your on your watch or your phone to get up once an hour and just do some movement Mm -hmm. to help pull that blood sugar down, lower your insulin. And and that that is by far the most effective method. That sounds amazing. And because like so many women, because of the high cortisol levels, you know, they're getting belly fat around their waist and they're not, you know, they're like, what am I doing? You know, like I'm, I'm eating right. I'm the same, I'm doing the same thing I've always done. And it all reserves back to your hormones, your cortisol level. And, you know, people, you know, people, you know, oh, I'm getting older. It's probably my metabolism, but a lot of times it's also based on your hormones and imbalanced hormones. Yeah. You know, as our estrogen starts to fluctuate, as we get older, as it starts to decline. So progesterone declines much faster than estrogen. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that's, that is often what people are experiencing. Perimenopause is like lower progesterone, which can result in estrogen dominance, which Mm -hmm. is all of the bad PMS symptoms you can imagine. We just think, oh, my PMS is bad. No, that's estrogen dominance, right? But then as the estrogen declines, it, it means that our ghrelin goes up, mm-hmm. which is your hunger hormone. So it, we are naturally hungrier as our estrogen declines and our leptin, which is the hormone uh, that controls how satiated you feel mm-hmm. that actually goes down. So then, so not, we're hungrier and we feel less full and we're not sleeping. So our cortisol's elevated. It's like this perfect storm for women to gain weight yeah. and redistributes from our thighs and our butt to our low belly yeah. when our estrogen dips as well. So it's, it all can be, we can't eliminate it at all together, right. but we can reduce the severity of it and, and take as best care of ourselves with stress management, with cycle syncing to fine tune that hormone balance. And you can really do this with just food. Yeah. Mostly diet is like 90% of it. Then you can supplement Mm -hmm. and then eventually, you know, go on some, uh, hormone replacement therapy. There's no need anymore. They used to be so afraid of it, but now all the new science is coming out that this is how women can have live better lives. Estrogen has over 400 jobs in the body. Yeah. Why are we not supplementing that as it declines in our older age is like, 
you 100% should be supplementing it. Yeah. Oh, for sure. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Now, if you had to take everything we talked about today and you had to summarize it, you know, with a couple of good points that you'd like to emphasize on, what are some things you'd like to emphasize to the listeners? You do not have to suffer this decade of your life. Mm -hmm. Alcohol is not serving you and change is possible. And it doesn't have to come from a marathon of willpower. Um, one of the best things you can do for your health as a woman in her forties going through perimenopause, menopause is to cut alcohol. That is the first step. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be as extreme as me and say never, ever, ever again, but moderation is difficult because if you're still believing that alcohol has some perceived benefit for you, mm -hmm. that's going to keep you in craving mode. And so once you learn and you debunk all these beliefs about alcohol serving you, you your desire goes away naturally. Yeah. And so that you aren't going to be in this place where you're like, oh, I'm missing out. You know, I can't, I can't, I can't. You're going to be like, wow, my life is so much better. And I feel so much better being yeah. alcohol free. It starts to feel like a privilege. It starts to, and, and you'll want to share it with everybody because you're like, this is the best kept secret ever, the best yeah. kept health secret. And I, and I, and don't shy away from the idea that like, yes, you will lose weight. Yes. You will reverse age. Your skin mm -hmm. will look better. You're going to sleep like a baby. Mm -hmm. um, and it starts, it starts there. And to not be intimidated by confronting a change in your relationship with alcohol, because there is no shame in pursuing your ultimate wellness. Right. 100%. Now you offer something on your website. You give a, a free download. Can you tell us a little about that? Yes. I have a hormone balancing checklist. Um, this is just like a 10 point checklist that is covering some of the foundations um, of what I talked about. Of course, you know, cutting alcohol is number one on there. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so people can go to my website. It's at findmyselffree.com and they can download that for free and join my community. Um, I also have a podcast. It's called find myself free, the podcast. And I kind of split my time there between alcohol and hormone balancing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, that's a great resource, a free resource for people to, to go and get to know me better and my story as well. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. And what kind of services do you provide for people? I do group coaching. Um, I'm currently in the middle of a 28 day uh, it's called the balance challenge. So we are learning to cycle sync. We're educating ourselves about our hormones and perimenopause and menopause. And a piece of that is also learning to cut alcohol. Um, and then I do one-on-one -on -one coaching. So if someone wants to go deeper and wants a more personalized, tailored approach, they can work one-on-one -on -one with me. And they can find all this on your website? All of this is on my website. Yeah. In addition to the balance challenge. So that is kind of... Um, the next one I believe I'm going to be doing in, am I going to be doing it? Uh, you'll have to stay tuned. Get on the wait list. If you, you can get on the wait list there, because I am not sure when I'm going to be rolling it out because it'll be summertime with my kids and it makes it a little more challenging. Yeah. Um, but I also have a evergreen digital course called the Brave Course mm -hmm. to kickstart your break from alcohol. So I designed this because I know a lot of people are intimidated by hiring a coach. Yeah. Um, even though we hire nutritionists and we hire, you know, personal trainers, hiring a coach to work on alcohol is like, oh, I don't know. Is it that serious? Do I really need to do that? Um, so this is something you can start with. And it's a done on your own self-paced coaching course. You'll it's 20 different modules. Um, and you'll you'll get me coaching you through some videos. Mm -hmm. And it goes through this whole subconscious deprogramming habit hacking and creating a life that you don't have to escape from. That's amazing. Wow. This has been great. Thank you so much, Ellie, for coming on the show and providing us with all this information. I think it's so important because people struggle all over the world with alcoholism and trying to become free of alcohol, you know, and it's a very, it's a hard, it's a hard task to do. So, you know, what you're doing is great. And you're showing them a very unique style of getting off of alcohol and, you know, and what's ahead, you know, you're doing it in a very mindful way and a very natural way and showing them all the different options and, and giving them the opportunity to have a new life. So that's amazing. And I thank you for that. 
Oh, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I want people to recognize you're not giving up anything. You're right. gaining you're gaining this incredible life and focusing on that is going to fuel you towards that. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Well, thank you so much for being on this show. I really appreciate thank you, your time. It's oh, been you're a welcome. Yeah. Have a great day. Thank you. You too.